Well, today we are continuing this series that we've been in for the last few weeks called Someone is Missing. And the idea behind this series is pretty simple, that the someone for most of us is the Holy Spirit. Like the Trinity, we think about it, you can think of it like this stool, right? For most of us, we have a relationship with God the Father and Christ the Son, and that's a good thing because those things, they can bear our weight. The problem is, um, because someone's missing, this is very unstable, right? If I pick up my feet, I could fall over. And so what ends up happening is that, that we end up having to, to bring the stability to our faith to kind of hold the thing all together. And so what we're trying to do throughout this series is, uh, is to say, to introduce all of us back to the Holy Spirit and not just learn things about the Holy Spirit, but to actually, to actually uh, integrate him into our life, to actually experience what it means to live by the Spirit. So that's what this whole series is about. And today we're going to continue in this series by answering a very, very simple question. And the question is, what does the Holy Spirit do? What does the Holy Spirit actually do? And, and there's really just one answer to this question. The, the Holy Spirit actually just does one thing. Now, there's a lot of other things that the Holy Spirit does to accomplish this one thing, but there's really just one overarching agenda for the Holy Spirit. Okay, so everybody got that. The Holy Spirit has one objective, but there's a lot of other things he does to accomplish that one objective. So if you're a note taker, um, we're going we're gonna to list out a lot of things in Scripture that the Holy Spirit does, but all of them are essentially to point to one thing. Okay, so what is the main objective? Jesus tells it to us in John chapter 16. So John chapter 16, the last night of Jesus' life, uh, he tells his disciples, I'm going to be gone, but I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to send you another advocate, actually one who's better than me. It's actually better that I go because I'm going to send you this advocate. And Jesus spends three chapters, John chapter 14, 15, and 16, teaching them and telling them all about the Holy Spirit. And in the middle of it, he shares with them this one overarching idea of the role of the Holy Spirit. This is his agenda. You ready? Jesus says, he, meaning the Holy Spirit, he will glorify me. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He will glorify me. The number one overarching agenda of the Holy Spirit is to make a great big deal out of Jesus and to help other people make a great big deal out of Jesus. So, has anybody in here ever had the privilege of running a spotlight in some type of theatrical setting? Anybody ever got to do that? Oh, we got a couple, all right, good. I've had this grand privilege of running a spotlight. The, the job of the person running the spotlight is very, very simple. You shine your spotlight on the person that you want everybody else to give their attention to. That's the whole job. Who is it that needs all of the attention? You shine the spotlight on them. When you work as a spotlight runner, like you have all the power. You can take everybody's attention and put it wherever you want. Wherever you shine that spotlight, every eye in the room is going to follow. Your job is to shine the spotlight on the most important person. That's what you do. And just in case you're wondering, the most important person is never you. <laughs> like if you're the spotlight runner, you never shine it on yourself, like ever. Like that's, that's not what you do. You never shine it on yourself, which is exactly the role of the Holy Spirit. He has come to shine a giant spotlight on Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not come with main character energy, as the kids say. He doesn't do that. 
He is the one behind the spotlight, never the one in the spotlight. So, to answer the question, what does the Holy Spirit do? He shines a giant spotlight on Jesus. Now, I want to share with you a few more scriptures that reveal this truth to us. Now, before I do that, however, I do want to reveal to you that there's a resource that could be helpful for you. Because again, I'm going to be sharing so many scriptures today, even the best of you note takers are not going to be able to keep up. So I want you to know that if you have your phone, you can pull out your app and right there on your app, every single week, you just pull up your dashboard. On the bottom right, you'll see this little more button. You just click on that little more button. This little menu will pop up, and there's a little place called Sermon Notes. All you gotta do is click on that little Sermon Note, and all of the text that I'm gonna share with you today will be listed right there in order. And so you don't have to worry about trying to write them all down. You can just scroll through them with me and have them for however long you want to have them, all right? So that's available to you. Here's what Jesus teaches us, John 15. When the counselor comes, counselor is another word for the Holy Spirit, whom I will send from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, here's what Jesus says, he will testify about me. Again, the Holy Spirit is going to be talking about Jesus, preaching about Jesus, pointing everyone to Jesus. He's going to testify about Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Therefore, I tell you, no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, again, is pointing people to Jesus. The main role is to glorify Jesus. So you can be sure that no one who has the Holy Spirit can say, Jesus is cursed. And you can be sure wherever you find the Spirit, you will find people declaring Jesus is Lord. That is the evidence of the Spirit at work in them. They're going to be pointing to Jesus in the same vein. 1 John chapter 4. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. You want to know if you're dealing with the Holy Spirit? Here's how you know. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. The primary role of the Holy Spirit is to acknowledge Jesus, to point to Jesus, to help others acknowledge Jesus so that everybody's attention is directed to Jesus. He did not come, the Holy Spirit did not come to steal attention, but to direct attention to Jesus. Which means that if you ever find yourself in an environment where the Holy Spirit is the one being given all of the attention and affection and adoration and glory above that of the person and work of Jesus, then you can know something's off. Something's off. Because the Spirit came to enlist and empower and enjoy the exaltation of Jesus. Not to deflect, divert, or distract from Jesus. So, now that we've established the overarching primary purpose and goal of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus and to invite and empower other people to glorify Jesus. Now we can talk about the multitude of other things that he does to accomplish that one purpose. And I want to start by talking about what the Holy Spirit does to accomplish that in the lives of of unbelievers, okay? We got the question recently, does the Holy Spirit work in the lives of unbelievers? And the answer is yes. And the reason that we know that is because there are believers. Because unless the Holy Spirit was working in the lives of unbelievers, there would be no believers. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that, that brings all of us to come to a place of belief in Jesus, okay? But he also is working in the world, in the lives of unbelievers, and Jesus tells us exactly what he does in the world for unbelievers, again, in John 16. 
Jesus writes, or Jesus says, when he comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will come to prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. So he's going to prove the world wrong about three things. So this is the life of the unbeliever, come to prove the world. Some of your Bibles say he comes to convict the world about these things, to prove the world wrong about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. Well, what does that mean, sin, righteousness, and judgment? How is he going to do that? Good question. He answers it. About sin, because people do not believe in me. That's the greatest and grandest of all sin. And he's coming to prove people wrong that, that, don't, that say that Jesus doesn't exist, who don't believe in him. And his number one aim in the life of the unbeliever is to convince them to believe in Jesus. Secondly, he's going to prove them wrong about righteousness. He's going to prove them wrong about righteousness because, Jesus says, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. The world has a standard of righteousness. Everybody has a standard of right and wrong. What the Holy Spirit is come to do in the world is to tell the world that your standard of righteousness is wrong. It's wrong. There are things that the world calls good that is actually evil. And there are things that the world says is evil that are actually good. Their standard of righteousness is wrong. And the Holy Spirit wants to convince them of that. Now, when Jesus was here, he could do that. That was his job. He walked around and helped people understand this is righteous, this is not righteous. But that isn't the case anymore because he went to the Father. Now the Holy Spirit is taking up that role in the world. Lastly, he says, I'm going to convince the world. He's going to prove the world wrong about judgment. The thing about our world is everybody's a judge. And we're judging people all the time. Like we go online to post our judgments about other people so that the world knows that we're judging people. Like we are great at judging people. The world is great at judging people. The problem is the world does not believe in a divine judgment. That's where they get it wrong. Great at judging others, have no idea or don't want to believe that there's ever going to be a time or place where they will be judged. And it says the Holy Spirit has come to prove the world wrong about judgment. Why? Because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The evil one has already been condemned through the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And he's proven the world wrong about judgment because if the if the evil one has already been condemned, then it only makes sense that the one who follows him will endure the same condemnation. There's a condemnation, a judgment coming. And the Holy Spirit wants everybody in the world to know that. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit for people who are unbelievers, to try to convince them to come to faith in Jesus. Now, I want to talk about what the Holy Spirit does to glorify Christ in the life of the believer. And again, I'm going to share a lot of scriptures with you, but what you need to know is this is not an exhaustive list. We could keep going, but I do hope it's a bit of an overwhelming list because I want all of us to understand just what we're missing out on when we ignore the gift of the Spirit in our life. I want you to know what you're missing out on when we when we refuse to believe in, submit to, and walk by the power of the Spirit. So, what does the Spirit do in the life of the believer? Here we go. He guides us in all truth. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you in all the truth. Part of what the Holy Spirit does is helps us to know between right and wrong. He's going to do that. He's going to help us know this is right, this is not. He guides us in truth. Number two, he empowers us. In Luke 24, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he says, I'm going to send to you what my Father has promised. That is the Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. He was pointing to the day of Pentecost. He uses it here in the end of Luke, the end of Matthew, and the beginning of Acts, and tells the disciples, stay here, you're going to be clothed with power. It's specifically power for changing the world, of taking the gospel to all nations, of seeing people transformed. 
He's going to change us and empower us through the Holy Spirit. Number three, he makes us sons of God. He says, Romans says, the spirit you received, capital S, brought about your adoption to sonship. Like it is the, the spirit of God that makes us sons of God. And ladies, that applies to you. You are not daughters of God. You have the standing of sonship. You are sons of the Most High. And that's important. Because in this culture, daughters did not get the inheritance of their father. Daughters don't keep the name of their father. You're born into a family, you're married off, and you take your husband's name. No, no, no. You have the status of a son. You have been given all of the rights, all of the privilege as the most high uh, son of God, co-heirs with Christ. You have been made the sons of God. And it happened through the Spirit of God. He confirms that we are God's children. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You ever have that moment where you wonder, am I in? Have I done enough? Am I good enough? Does he love me? It is the Spirit himself that whispers into our own souls that says you're in. God, you are his child. He leads us. For those of us who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit is leading us. The question is, are you following him? He sanctifies us. It's a big Bible word to saying he is making the outside look like what the inside already is. That's what that means. He's being justified, meaning made right before God. We already stand before the Lord justified before God. But the Spirit is transforming us on the outside to make the outside look like what the inside already is. Paul writes it this way, but we ought to always thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Like he is changing us from the inside out to make us look like Jesus. He brings about rebirth and renewal. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who is doing this work of rebirth in us. He produces fruit as visible evidence of his work in our life. Many of you all have heard of the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. I always say patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He's producing that in us. And it is visible outward fruit that other people can see that reveals that he is at work on the inside of us. He gives gifts to all the people of God for use in the body of Christ. Like the Holy Spirit, if you are in Christ, you have a spiritual gift given not for you. Don't miss this. But given for the body. Look at what it says. There are different kinds of gifts. But the same Spirit distributes them. It is the Spirit who gives away the gifts. Now to each one... The manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Not given for your good. You don't receive gifts from the Spirit for you. You receive gifts of the Spirit for the body of Christ. Let's keep going. He calls us to specific ministry. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. It is the Holy Spirit speaking into a body of believers and said, Give me that one and that one. I've got a special job for them. Now, what's interesting about this one is, do you know what happened next? Anybody? You know what happened next? He calls them to ministry. You know what happened next? They went. Look at what it says. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The Holy Spirit says, give me that one and that one. And they said, okay, here we go. Holy Spirit, you got them. Get out of here. Like he sent them. And they went. Like, 
They didn't wait around for instructions. They didn't, they weren't given any other details. The Spirit called them and they responded. And I can't help but think that there are some of you and you have been called. You've been called. As clearly as the Lord coming and speaking into your ear, you know that he has called you for a specific ministry purpose. For some of you, it may be he's called you into full-time ministry. And you know it. For some of you, maybe he's called you into a a gospel-centered conversation that you need to have with an adult child or your pickle-playing partner. I don't know. But you know that God's called you into this moment for a specific ministry, and yet you're still waiting around convincing yourself it's not the right time. And I just want to tell you today, if he's called you, it's the right time. He seals us for the day of redemption. What does he do? He seals us. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The seal is God's stamp of approval on your life that reveals that you belong to him. He is the guarantee of our inheritance. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. You ever have that moment of doubt that's saying, is God really going to give us everything he's promised? Is heaven really going to happen? Is Jesus really coming back? Am I really going to get to be in his presence forever? The answer to all of that is the Holy Spirit is in you. Of course you're going to get to be in his presence forever because his presence is already in you. He's not going to leave his presence out. He's not going to leave his spirit out because the spirit is in you. You are going to inherit all that he has promised. He has set us free from sin and death because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. It is the spirit who gives life and sets us free from our sin and death. He establishes, the Holy Spirit establishes leaders in his church. This is what the Apostle Paul told the Ephesian elders. He says, keep watch over yourself, elders, and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. It is the Holy Spirit who picks leaders for his church and sets them as overseers, as shepherds over his flock. That's what the Holy Spirit does. What else does he do? He transforms us into the likeness of Christ. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate, uh, contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You are being transformed. If you're following after the Spirit, he will transform you into the likeness of Christ by the Spirit that is in you. What else does he do? He helps us understand the things of God. But we have received, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Why? So that we may understand what God has freely given us. The reason that you and I can understand all of the good gifts that he has given us is because we have the spirit. He allows us to understand the goodness of his grace. It's the Holy Spirit who does that. He enables us to wait for what we hope for. Listen to this one. For through the Spirit, for through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Has any of you ever looked in the mirror and you say, God, where's all the righteousness you promised? Anybody? No, just me? Okay. It's good to know y'all better than me. But you get to this place in your faith where you're like, I thought it would come faster. I thought I'd be different by now. I thought the righteousness would be a little more evident. But yet it's the Holy Spirit who's in there whispering, saying, it's coming. It hasn't all happened yet, but it's coming. Pieces and parts now, but in full 
soon. It's coming. He gives us hope as we wait. He strengthens us. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner, inner being. He strengthens us when we're struggling, when we're going through hard times. I had a lady share with me today that when she was going through cancer treatments, that she felt the strength of the Lord in a way that she had never felt it in her life. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He strengthens us in our time of pain. He reveals the mysteries of God. Paul writes this, in reading this, in reading this letter that has the gospel, and he says, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it's been, made, as it's been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles. The Holy Spirit is the one who revealed the mystery of the gospel. And we get to experience it. We get to understand it. Because he shared it with the apostles to share it with us. David didn't understand it. Isaiah didn't. Jeremiah didn't. Job didn't. They didn't get it. But we get it. Why? Because the Spirit shares it with us. He confirms that Christ is in us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. You want to know if Christ lives in you? Here's how you know. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. Again, it is the spirit who is telling us that Christ is in us and we are in Christ. He clearly speaks. Scripture teaches that the spirit clearly speaks. And sometimes he speaks on his own. Paul says the Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. That's happening right now. And the Spirit made that clear. Sometimes he speaks on his own. Sometimes he speaks through teachers or preachers. Again, Paul writes, this is what we speak. Talking about him and the other apostles who are teaching and preaching. Not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. And so when Spirit teaches us things, then we explain spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. So sometimes the Spirit speaks for himself. Sometimes the Spirit speaks to a teacher or a preacher, and that preacher or teacher then speaks the Spirit-taught words to the people. Sometimes the Spirit speaks through prophets. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter's speaking about all of those prophets in the Old Testament. So we take this section with all these prophets who spoke on behalf of God, all of the apostles who wrote and spoke on behalf of God, and he says, look, all of that happened, everything we have recorded in the Bible, that was not any man's doing, that was the Holy Spirit of God. They taught what was spoken from God that was carried by the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit at work. He speaks through our conscience. Paul writes, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. He speaks. And then this may be the most important. He brings unity to the body of Christ. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. One, united. The Holy Spirit brings the unity in the body of Christ. So make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. And I want to say this. This Unity in the body of Christ is one of the greatest evidences that the Spirit is at work in the body of believers. It may be the greatest evidence. Here's what we know. The greatest evidence is not signs and wonders. It is not signs and wonders. You know how we know that? 
Because Jesus and the apostles promised us that in the last days our enemy would come and counterfeit signs and wonders among the people of God to steal away believers from Christ. The signs and wonders piece can be counterfeited, but the unity of Christ cannot be counterfeited. One of the greatest, greatest pieces of evidence that the body of Christ, I'm sorry, that the spirit is at work among the body of Christ is the unity in the body. Lastly, a few more. He equips us for battle through his word. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We'll talk about that a little bit more next week. He pours love into our hearts. Have you ever had a sense of the presence of God in your heart. You felt the love of the Lord. If you have, that's the work of the Spirit. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. If you feel the love of God, it's because of the work of the Spirit. He reminds us of God's truth. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I've said to you. Have you had that moment where something just popped out of your mouth that you hadn't thought about in years, but it was just the word that somebody needed in that moment? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he encourages us. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. He encourages us. And let me give you one more. He prays for us. Again, this may be one of the most powerful. We talked about this when we went through Romans. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And you all, many of you know this, but every time you read it, you add a word to it that isn't there. We add in a word And we make this say something to the effect of when we do not know what we ought to pray for, the Spirit prays for us. It doesn't say when. It makes a declarative statement. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Because we're sinful. I don't know what I'm going to need tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know if healing is actually the best thing for Grandma. I don't know. But the one who knows the Spirit of God knows. And so he is praying on my behalf because in my weakness, I don't even know what I ought to pray for. But he does. And so he prays for us. This this is what the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer. These are just some of them. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of what we're missing out on for the 62% of Bible-believing Christians, of born-again, self-identified Christians who don't believe that the Holy Spirit is real. The question is, are you leaning into the Holy Spirit to do these things? Because this is how the third leg of the stool gets added in. It's all of this stuff where we actually begin to trust the Holy Spirit to do these things that God has promised that he's given us him to do. And it is so glorious when we actually begin to trust him that we can actually sit down and take a load off and rest that God has got it covered. When I'm trying to do this work, it's exhausting and no wonder we want to quit. But imagine if we actually trusted that there is a part of the Godhead that is alive and well in me to accomplish this. That's why this series is so important. Not for us just to know more about the Spirit, but to actually experience all that he has to offer for us. So here's the question for today. Are you leaning into the Spirit to do these things in your life? One step further, what would it look like if you did? This is the conversation I want you to have with whatever group you're in this week. Father, we are grateful for your Spirit. Forgive us for for pushing him aside, for ignoring and not leaning in to all that you have given him to do in our life. 
Holy Spirit, do your work among us. Open our eyes to see you at work. May we join you, follow you wherever it is that you lead. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.